Welcome to Radio Bio, a podcast all about biology from molecules to ecosystems. I'm Kinsey Brock, a second year PhD student at the University of California, Merced. And today I'm joined by my friend and fellow graduate student, Jeff Lauder. Thank you. Today we're joined by Dr. Emily Jane McTavish, assistant professor at University of California, Merced. Thank you for being here, Dr. McTavish. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you study? Um, I'm broadly interested in evolution. So um, my the focus of my current research is understanding evolutionary relationships between species, and especially this idea that right now it's getting so much easier to sequence genomic data. We really have lots and lots of information about species, and that means that we need to develop new computational tools and new um, sort of ways of processing and analyzing those data to understand evolutionary relationships. So I got into this trying to directly ask questions about the relationships among salamander species and among different breeds of cattle. Uh, but the work I'm doing now is actually kind of a step further back from that, where I'm developing software to try and address those questions broadly rather than working on specific questions. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, which I think is of course, as an evolutionary biologist, I uh, think that's really important. But also as a phylogeneticist, I think that in an applied way, like if you really want to use that information about nothing in biology making sense except in the light of evolution, I think that really means that nothing in biology makes sense except in the context of phylogenetics, in the context of understanding these evolutionary relationships among species. Um, and that's what I study. And to me, that really holds together a lot of patterns and processes across all of biology. Right. So thinking about breadth in biology and talking about, you know, phylogenetics and what you do, how did you decide to study phylogenetics? That's a good question. And I'm not sure exactly what the answer is. I, I was very interested in organisms. Like a lot of people in biology, I liked being out in nature um, my dream job as a kid was to be a park ranger. Yes. Um, <laughs> which, and I think that part of that was that for me, that was like this, that was this biology job that was out there that would allow me to do that. And so as an undergrad, I volunteered for a professor at McGill University where I did my undergrad who was tracking toad dispersal. And so I spent six weeks in a row for two summers in a row just going out every night and catching toads and um, tracking where these toads were going day to day and year to year. Um which gave me a really nice in-depth look at these biological processes of dispersal. And so I loved that work. I love being on the field. I love catching toads. Um, but going into my PhD, I was interested in trying to use genetic tools to look at dispersal because I saw that it was a little bit, um, uh, it's big questions, these questions of how an organisms are moving from place to place. And if you have to catch them everywhere they go and individually mark them. It's hard to really get at those questions on a broad scale. I mean, it's a great way to, to really understand on a fine scale. Right. And so then I got interested in uh, sort of these genetic markers of diversity and divergence um, and ended up getting really excited about phylogenetic methods. Right. So... It doesn't sound like there was like an, a one aha moment or someone who really influenced you in your path. It was more of an evolution of, <laughs> wow, <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> thank you, uh, of, you know, you and your kind of journey through undergrad and the experiences that you had in the field. And Yeah, I think so. I mean, I had really supportive undergraduate mentors that made me excited about biology. It's actually looking backwards now, I... Uh, see that the computational work that I'm doing now that I ended up learning to program as a grad student, but actually those sort of seeds were planted by an undergraduate mentor that mm. I had, um, which is fun. I was just hearing this week that Jessica Blois, also here in the department, is um, is in a working group uh, mm -hmm. with this guy, um, Brian McGill, who was one of my like undergraduate thesis mentors. And he was the person who first was like, oh, well, if you want to understand these dispersal distributions, you really need to build these statistical models uh, and uh, look at some basic programming in R. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's 
funny looking backwards at the time I didn't see that as this major pivotal moment. I just saw it as a really frustrating thing that yeah. I had to <laughs> figure out in order to finish my honors thesis. Um, but looking backwards, it's cool that these people that influenced me then are now sort of colleagues in the field, which is awesome. Yeah, that's really that's a really cool thing about academia in general. Um, so speaking of which, you know, it was park ranger when yeah. you were younger. Yeah. Um, then you really liked being in the field. And, you know, now you're a computational scientist. So, you know, how did you become a scientist that's, yeah, how did you become a tool builder rather than like a strictly a tool user? Yeah, that is a good question. And for me, I think it was a combination of factors. One of them is that I discovered that I'm not good at lab work. <laughs> I like, don't even understand Honest, like how <laughs> I'm this bad at it because I know how to cook and I can cook like very complicated things. Yeah. And like PCR is not that different and it shouldn't be harder. Uh, but so when I was starting my PhD, I was doing some lab work. I was sequencing like a single mitochondrial gene from salamanders and I was really struggling with it. And I was like, this is hard and it doesn't feel logical and it's not fun. And also, I started my PhD in 2007, and so while I was, like, fighting really hard to get these very small sequence data sets, it was already, you know, the human genome had been sequenced. Like, right. these genomic tools were coming down the pipe and were obviously available for lots of taxa, just not the ones I was looking at right then. Mm -hmm. And so during my PhD, uh, I was, like, just a summer side project, somebody asked if I could analyze this very large data set of cattle whole genome data. And there I really saw the possibilities of analyzing large scale data and that it caused me to move away from this question. I was looking at salamanders because I was convinced that much better, much bigger data was going to be available really soon. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of building the tools to answer the kind of questions I wanted to using that data was a better forward looking approach. It's kind of interesting that you pointed out uh, kind of one of the concerns going into academia is sometimes what we'd call even saturation. We were actually just talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, so I'm curious if part of that saturation is actually what led you to your field as well, because so, uh, we've had some discussions recently about uh, how sometimes when a field gets saturated, building tools is actually kind of a good way to move the field forward as opposed to kind of dwelling on those same questions. So I guess I would ask saturation in terms of, of um, question, like the key questions being answered or in terms of the number of people academia is able to support answering those questions. Yeah, so uh, from kind of young budding academics, mm -hmm. uh, in your experience, do you feel like the concern over a almost overabundance of scientists competing for an academic job kind of actually helped push you into a specific niche uh, to, to end up creating tools? You know, that's an interesting question. And I'm not sure that it did. I, I mean, I probably subconsciously or on some level, it definitely did. I would say I kind of felt... Um, going in the other direction, I felt really lucky that when I started programming, like I said, I got into this to be a field biologist. I learned to program mostly in grad school. Um, and I felt really lucky that I happened to love that and I happened to really enjoy that. Um, but the fact that that was, that there's a more open pathway in that direction, I'm sure, um, affected my decisions to pursue that over sort of maybe more empirical questions that that there was less opportunities for funding. So kind of taking a step back for some of our listeners who might not be familiar, uh, what is phylogenetics? How do biologists use phylogenetics? Um, and what can these approaches tell us about uh, evolution, organisms we're interested in? What's a phylogenetic tree? And how does that relate to you know family trees that children learn about? So kind of just walk us through what phylogenetics is. Sure. On the broader scale, it's Trying, it's a way of understanding the evolutionary relationships between species. So uh, tracking back in time to look at what groups of species share a more recent common ancestor than other groups of species. Like, for example, 
sticking close to home, uh, humans and chimps uh, have more shared ancestry. They have a more recent common ancestor than humans and chimps do with gorillas. And uh, you can trace those ancestral relationships uh, with more or less accuracy going back all the way to um, sort of the relationships between all species on Earth. Um which I think is really cool. And so those thinking about evolution in that framework of shared ancestry and what groups are sharing a more recent common ancestor gives us a context to understand um, when traits evolved, say. Um, so like if you're interested in echolocation in bats, um, there is an example where if you look at the relationships among bats, you see that it looks on that uh, species level relationships that echolocation might have evolved twice. Um, and that's been a really cool and interesting question for biologists to think about. So it's a way of trying to assess where, like where traits are coming from in shared ancestors and uh, putting those traits in context. So a lot of phylogenetic trees, it seems like, are kind of used for classification. So we can look back and find when these traits arose in case we want to study those traits and their effects on things or the ecology of those traits. Um, so a lot of the history of uh, phylogenetics kind of stems from taxonomy, arguably. Um, I agree. So taxonomy's history, to some, arguably, uh, had a role in classification. So we use it to categorize things to help us study them like we were just talking about. So uh, how does phylogenetics kind of play into categorization? So does it still play a role in just classifying organisms and traits, or is it now moving on towards finding specific differences in two organisms that share trait, let's say? Yeah, um, I think both of those can be true. I mean, taxonomy and classification of different species is still a very important role in phylogenetics. It's um, really essential to how we understand diversification and diversity across the landscape. And um, even though naming species isn't something I'm especially interested in, actually without naming groups of organisms, then you can't really compare things. You can't say when you have found, say, two representatives of the same population, of the same evolutionary unit, um, or when you're looking at really different evolutionary trajectories. So I would say taxonomy and classification is still a really important role, but that um, for me, the understanding of these evolutionary relationships is a, is a goal in and of itself. So do you think that there might be, in some cases, almost competing interests there? So, uh, for example, when we think of herpetology or ornithology, there's been some recent transitions of uh, how things are classified. So, for example, if we have two birds that look alike and for all other intents and purposes are classified as similar, but then now through molecular methods, we now say they're different. So at what point do you think or do you think that there's actually a point beyond which um, phylogenetics and taxonomy might uh, be counter to um, the purpose we're using them for? So they, if they go beyond classification and what's the use for them then? Yeah, I think... I think that's true, but I wouldn't agree that it's a problem. I would say that um, you know phylogenetics tends to be thinking about or talking about these relationships at at or above this species level. That the, you're talking about these broad categorical units, um, not just individuals, and that's hard. Um, it's hard to make sure you're getting those categories right. Um, and that at that interface between population genetics, where you're thinking about relationships among individuals um, and phylogenetics, you can get some confusion. There's some hard right. parts. There's, uh, you know, individuals of hybrid origin, things like that. Um, but I still think that by getting more information about that, we're not losing this broad scale information about species relationships. Right. And so, you know, there are lots of different kinds of phylogenetic trees out there. Uh, you know, some use morphological traits or detailed measurements of body form and function to estimate these evolutionary relations, history, history of evolutionary relationships among taxa. And then as technology progressed, we see the move toward the use of genetic data to estimate these relationships. And now we even see trees that incorporate both. So genetic and morphological data. Um, what have you used in your research? I know like you, you do a lot of computational stuff now, but when you were, 
like more applied and using those methods? And do you think one trumps another? My focus has been on molecular data. That's what I'm used to. But yeah. I mean, there's a lot of evolutionary history that we really want to understand that we're never going to have molecular data for. Right. Like yep. dinosaurs. Yep. First off, <laughs> I was like, some people are optimistic about sequencing DNA from dinosaurs. You not so much. I am not among those people. <laughs> All I right. think that there's some real like sort of physics and degradation related constraints yeah. there that not only is that not happening now, that will never happen. So we're restricted to using these morphological exactly. characters, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, and so I do think that in cases where we have this whole genome data, we have a lot, a lot of information to speak to a shared evolutionary history. And that's fun and cool and really useful. But it doesn't mean that we should discard uh, these other questions that so we have less data, but still really useful data to answer. An interesting subfield in phylogenetics that I'm interested in is the study of macroevolution mm -hmm. or the evolution of whole taxonomic groups over a long period of time. Maybe not such a long period of time, depends what you're looking at. But a particular aspect of this field that I'm interested in is estimating diversification rates or you know, how fast species and lineages are splitting and diverging into distinct new things. So where are we as a field with the level of confidence that we can put into these estimations of diversification rates? That's a good question, and it's a hard question. <laughs> um, for some reasons that are, I think, conceptually straightforward and some statistical reasons that are conceptually a little bit harder. Yeah. But I would say uh, in the most straightforward way of thinking about that, um, one reason that we have trouble estimating diversification rates is because we don't have a very good estimate of what species used to exist and don't anymore. Right. So extinct taxa, that um, there was some kind of diversification, new species arose, and they died out. Um, one, the major reason that we don't know about this is because the fossil record is really, uh, sparse. Most things that lived in the past, we don't have records of. Right. Um, and so that means that we're already, we're already missing a lot mm -hmm. of data and it's hard to fill in the gaps there. Um, and so that I would say is one just general problem. Mm hmm the other issue is related to this idea that you don't have a lot of independent samples to try and estimate these rates from. Right. So it's like if you're trying to estimate like the proportion of like red and black uh, balls in some sort of like urn. In an urn. This got this turned real dark real quick. Oh my god. I'm I'm going like Grecian, not right. like a cremation urn. Okay, okay. All right, it's a bucket. It's a bu it's a bucket right, of balls. A bucket. All right. And there's no dead Cre <laughs> there's no cremains involved. All right. Um, but so if you're trying to estimate the proportion, then maybe you can take like a couple different samples and be like, all right, how often do I get like this many of this or this many of that? I mean that's also something you can do if you're trying to get like body size of lizards or something. Right you capture a bunch of them and then you measure them and you see kind of the distribution and you have like some sort of plus or minus on that. But with these speciation events, like if you think that something happened to an ancestral lineage in the past that made it more likely or less likely to speciate, you don't really have a very good sample giving you information about that. Right. There's that one ancestral lineage and then it speciates that uh, now you have these two new lineages that maybe have some different qualities. Maybe they continue to have high speciation rates. But unlike a process where you get a lot of samples and get to look at those and get an idea of distributions, you often kind of just have this one event. Right. Like that ancestral population ends mm -hmm. at that time that you consider it to have speciated. And so... That's a little bit hand wavy of an explanation, but I do think that that's why that can be a really statistically hard problem to look into that there's been kind of a lot of discussion about in the field recently. Definitely. Um, so another big bait, debate that exists in the phylogenetics world is between, I don't know if validity is the right word, but like between gene trees and species trees. <laughs> and 
what are these things? What are gene trees? What are species trees? Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what they are and what the debate's about? <laughs> I sure can. Yes. Um, so like a lot of debates or dichotomies in biology, it's it's a bit of a of a false split, but but I'll set it up. Uh, so the idea is that these species trees, like I was saying, are capturing the relationships of groups of organisms. That it's these um, diverging lineages, but it's capturing the evolutionary history of a whole population of this whole evolutionary unit. Whereas. Um, and there can be a lot of variation within the genome, within like certain regions of the genome about what the exact evolutionary relationships are. For example, I was saying about how humans and chimps are more closely related to each other than they are to gorillas. Um, that's true broadly across the whole genome. But there's actually a lot of like little pieces of DNA, a lot of parts of our genomes where humans are more closely related to gorillas than they are to chimps right. and where chimps are more closely related to gorillas than they are to humans. Um, like all of those permutations are possible. And that just has to do with the fact that um, – in this shared ancestor that we had before uh, humans and chimps and gorillas, before any of those species diverged, there was a lot of variation that was pre-existing in that ancestor. And sometimes kind of by random sampling uh, through time, uh, kind of different copies of those genes got um, ended up in humans versus chimps. Right. Um, and so there, if you want to think about a specific trait – like I mentioned, echolocation in bats. So looking at this species tree of bats, it looked like echolocation had evolved more than once. But actually, if you look at the specific molecular mechanisms of echolocation, um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that these genes that are used for echolocation in bats predate any of those divergences. And that even though um, these two major bat clades that are able to echolocate aren't sister to each other. Um, if you're looking at the gene tree, if you're tracking the bifurcations of that, or like kind of the splits through time of that gene that's used for echolocation, yeah. then they are more closely related to each mm -hmm. other. So the question there becomes, which one of these should we care about? Right. Okay, let's transition to talking about the Open Tree of Life project. Um, you, the aim of the project, it's a huge project, but the overall aim is to construct a comprehensive, digitally available tree of life by kind of synthesizing a bunch of published trees, so uh, trees that people create and um, through either empirical work or whatever and publish on the internet with taxonomic data. So can you talk a little bit more about the project and your specific role in it? Yeah, sure thing. Um, it's a really, I think it's a really cool, really exciting project. It was put together before I was involved at all by a mm -hmm. great team of PIs. This was like a really big um, collaborative project with, uh, I think, 11 different professors at 10 different institutions leading it. So it was funded by the NSF and... Um, the idea was that there was a team of people both that had expertise in different areas of the tree of life, like plants and vertebrates and fungi, really broad scale areas of the tree of life, and also a team of computational software development people, and that by working all together, we could get a unified estimate of relationships across the entire tree of life, um, like currently 2.2, 2.4 2 million species. Wow. Yeah. It's a ton of data. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of data and it was a very computationally challenging problem. It was sort of both computationally challenging and I guess like culturally challenging. There's a lot of data, a lot of analyses that have been done where the data isn't reusable or accessible. Okay. And so that was one of the both that was one of the problems we were facing and one of the problems we were trying to solve was that there's been a lot of analyses done on what the relationships are among, you know, fish in this uh, specific group, among this different family of plants. But then those evolutionary relationships that, as I was saying earlier, really 
good context for drawing other biological conclusions, mm -hmm. they're published, they're printed out in a PDF somewhere, right. but they're not accessible as the raw material for later analyses, okay. which is a problem because they're really important raw material for later analyses. Um, and so we were working on digitizing this previously published information and then the computational challenges of unifying that across the whole tree of life. Okay. Um, so a lot of parts I was working on was a way to easily um, import and update these previous estimates. Uh, because like a lot of kinds of data, even if you do get the files from the person that originally made them, there's often errors, there's typos, there's misspellings, there's <laughs> just a lot of stuff. Yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I feel you. Uh, that. I'm doing like a really small scale project right now and finding it just so difficult to find, like make sure that the data is good. So, I mean, it sounds yep. like with a huge project like this, that problem is just magnified. Yeah, it's a huge problem and it's a scary problem because anytime you like quote unquote fix something, you're changing your data and that makes me anxious and should make <laughs> everyone very anxious. So how much of that work do you would you actually almost even quantify a percentage roughly is kind of just developing standards of data almost and changing, you know, make sure everyone's is compatible? Yeah, certainly a lot of it does involve developing data standards. A lot of work in the project was done by a web developer actually making just an easily accessible tool to um, fix and update these things. And then another uh, important aspect I was working on was using like a version control system, basically um, where you can upload your data and then uh, either you or anybody else can fix things that were wrong, kind of like a wiki-like model, um, but that keeps track of any changes that were made to that data at any time. So it gives you the opportunity to open it up, make it sort of straightforward and easy to correct errors but never lose that trajectory of what happened. So if you're like, oh, actually that correction was a mistake, you can track back uh, who made it, more or less. It can be anonymous. But Not it's... corrupting the data or anything. Exactly. And so that, I think, was a really important development, and it's um, important in how I think about data in any context. Any time that uh, somebody has data from their field work or uh, something like that and it's stored in an Excel spreadsheet, it's really important to have a lockdown copy of that where nothing will ever change. And it's fine to um, sort of add layers on top of that, uh, do different things with that data, exclude things because you're pretty sure it was a typo, something was wrong, but really locking down that both that original data set and that process, I think, is really important. Yeah, I had an old advisor who used to call it kind of the field of data archaeology because you're going back and trying to fill in some of the gaps you've created and correct some of the mistakes you've made. It's terrifying. Um, so how can so it's called the Open Tree of Life project. So how can scientists actually access and contribute to this project? Yeah, so um, there's a couple different ways to interact with it. Um, I think the one that's most popular is if you just want to know the relationships between some set of organisms. Um, you can see the whole tree at tree.opentreeoflife.org, um, but it's actually a little bit hard to with. 2.2 million species all related in uh, these bifurcating tree-like relationships. It's actually pretty hard to display on a web browser. Mm -hmm. There's a neat project called Philotastic, um, <laughs> which I think is charming but somewhat ridiculous. Um, <laughs> just the name, the project is not ridiculous. <laughs> but um, where there, if you go to the Philotastic website, you can um, put in any species that you're interested in. Say you're an ecologist and you want to know the relationships of the seven kinds of shrubs that are on your plot. You can just type in their names, either common names or Latin names, and it'll spit back out a tree showing the relationships of all of those species. That is really sweet. <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, so those are the kind of downstream ways that uh, it's useful. The other upstream one is if you're like, if you look at that tree and you're like, no, these lizard relationships are definitely wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hypothetically. <laughs> But so here, because we have just this like open data input pipeline, if you have a phylogeny, either that you published or that somebody else did, that 
you think has a better estimate of the trees than the ones that we're showing, you can upload that into our database, make sure everything's correct, make sure the like taxonomic labels are right, and then that can be added into these new versions of the tree. So you can both get data out at the end, but also put data in at the beginning. Where do you see the field in like 10 years even? So I think we're really looking at this transition point where instead of even thinking about gene trees and species trees, the idea of thinking about a gene tree is kind of related to this idea that you've sequenced a single locus that's somehow isolated from the rest of the genome. And that's never true. Um, I mean, I guess if you're thinking about mitochondria, then they don't recombine, so they could be a gene tree. But Mostly, I think we really need to start thinking on a more explicitly genomic scale. So taking into account processes like recombination, which is something that actually we mostly try and just filter out our data so that we don't have to deal with that. Um, I think that uh, we're gaining a lot more context for our data, but we're not ready yet to use that information. And I think that that's where things are going is really building tools, building um methods that can take into account that information. So we're both kind of from a field biologist background. <laughs> so uh, Kinsey's getting a little bit into phylogenetics in her research. I am not. <laughs> um, so you do you, <laughs> I've been told. Um, do you see the relationship between field biology and computational biology phylogenetics uh, changing in the future? And really kind of the question is, is field biology in its final throes? And can you please say no? I don't think that it is. Um, I think that for certain questions, we can gather data that wasn't available to us before through these genomic computational techniques. Um, I saw some really great talks this past week about getting whole genome data from preserved specimens in museums. So sort of uh, taking advantage of, of field work that's happened in the past and maybe not needing to go out and sample new individuals to get that fresh tissue that in the intervening few decades might have been needed. Now it seems like we're getting a lot better at getting DNA even from um, samples from, you know, 100 years ago. So I think that certainly these things can interplay with each other um, That uh, and getting whole genome data from a few individuals can give us a lot of information about a population that only sequencing a very little bit of information, we would need to sample a lot more individuals. So I think that there's definitely interplay between these things but that there's a lot of questions that we can't answer yet because we really haven't seen what's happening in those, in those uh, organisms and those processes in the wild. Um, I mean, especially, I think, in the face of climate change and um, those ongoing shifts that it's really going to take continuing field work to look at these shifts in, in these patterns and processes on a on a much broader scale in a way that genomic data really would never and could never answer. So scientists are pretty lucky. We get to ask questions that interest us and come up with new ways to answer them. And we were wondering, what's your personal favorite part about what you do? Hmm. There's a lot of parts I really like about it. Um, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I claimed that I had never had a real job. Um, and I was, I'm, I'm not even sure what I meant by that, because I have had various jobs in biology. Uh, but I, I mean, I think I meant that I really love what I do. And so it doesn't feel like work. Um, but yeah, the parts that I love the most, I think, are really the discussion. Like I just came back from this uh, Society of Systematic Biologists meeting where I got to see a bunch of people that I really like and respect both personally and professionally and just get to spend time talking about concepts and like what things we think are important. And uh, and I love that collegiality. I love that camaraderie. And um, and that for me is really, really special. A lot of scientists like to talk about kind of the big questions that they're working on. So what's kind of your big question right now? So 
it not coincidentally is very closely related to where I said I think phylogenetics is going in the next 10 years. Nice. That may have been a biased answer about where phylogenetics is going. But um, but I do think that the big questions involve really integrating genomic data in a way that isn't trying to force it into um, – what older data used to look like, um, really trying to take advantage of all of the information we're getting from this genome scale data. So I'm very proud of this question. <laughs> a lumper and a splitter walk into a bar. Who buys the drinks? <laughs> Wait, is it a question or a joke? <laughs> I, I think we have come full circle with like <laughs> jokes that are not funny and are not jokes. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. I think they fun. split them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, Dr. McTavish, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thanks you for are, having me. Yeah, you're such a pleasure. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Kenzie. Right on. Okay. This yeah, is... thanks to you guys both for having me. Yeah, right on. So this is Radio Bio signing off. Radio Bio is supported by the Quantitative and Systems Biology Graduate Group at the University of California, Merced.